Tom Farnquist, Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society's Executive Director. I and like that, I like that camera. <laughs> and here, G Guido Ebert, freelance editor. Jens Ebert, hanger on. And here's truly Patrick. <laughs> that was, and, and you carry, I suppose, cameras with your, if you're just diving. We got a lot oh, of guys right? who take swimming cameras with them. You know, oh. and, uh, if you want to penetrate inside of ships, you know, with, mm -hmm. with good LED lighting packages and stuff. I suppose so. Yeah, that way we can, we can do it. So we were just talking about how the ships needed to come around Whitefish Point to get right. into the harbor. Well, get into the lee of get into the lee of Whitefish Point. Yeah. Whitefish Bay is huge, yeah. but it's really uh, an open stretch of water that you have to cross to get to Sault Ste. Marie and down through the locks or coming up. You got to get to Whitefish Point and round the corner into all of Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. And so collisions were the most popular reason, not popular, but the most common cause of sinkings here. And the further west you go, more and more ships are lying. We've been about 550 shipwrecks on Lake Superior over the years, and many, many, many hundreds of people have died on them. Now, Lake Superior has the least number of shipwrecks, only because it wasn't opened up until around 1855 to serious shipping when they built the locks. The lower lakes now had been, you know, uh, shipping on the lower lakes had been happening for a long time prior to that. So overall, there's between an estimated between maybe six and ten thousand ships that have gone down on the Great Lakes. Wow, wow, six thousand total. But, but how many are off of Whitefish Point? Tom? Well, we've we found about forty off Whitefish Point that we've located over the years, and uh, you know, shallow, deep, some too deep to even dive. When did surveying begin? When when did folks start looking for this? Actually, the first people to really start searching for shipwrecks on Lake Superior was 1972. And uh, I was part of that expedition because this guy came from Waukegan, Illinois, that had a, a QJB sonar that was taken from a submarine and put into his fish tub. And we came around the point and we saw a wreck two, uh, two miles away. That's how good the sonar was. It ended up being the John B. Cowell that Patrick built, actually. Yeah, that was a fun wreck. What's your favorite means of getting out there and exploring now, Tom? Well, uh, I still dive, but I enjoy flying an ROV much more because. When we go to document a shipwreck, we can actually do a pretty good job in a couple of days with an ROV. It doesn't have any depth problems. It's totally unmanned. We've got a 1,500-foot tether with fiber optics for a high-definition camera. We've got three video cameras and a still camera and its own sonar, so we can actually explore the debris fields now, things that you couldn't swim off and explore when you were a diver because you're down there in total darkness. You wouldn't dare leave the safety of the line getting back to your own dive boat. So an ROV is really the way the Shipwreck Society more effectively and efficiently explore and document shipwrecks now. We have a very sophisticated digital side scan sonar that we tow behind the boat that locates wrecks and we grid off areas and just kind of mow the lawn and eliminate areas of the lake looking for our targets. Mm -hmm. We put the ro robot down to the floor. So what becomes of these wrecks? Uh, obviously they're still there. Why do you want to know where they are? Uh, the adventure, the excitement, solving mysteries of ships that disappeared long ago. Uh, nothing is more exciting to me than exploring a ship that maybe somebody hasn't seen for a hundred years. A new wreck. A new a virgin new wreck. wreck. That, is, that oh. is the ultimate thrill. There aren't too many adventures anymore where you can actually go see something that nobody else has ever seen before. They haven't. And they're down there, frozen moments, frozen in time. Step a hundred years back in time, just like that's that. That's what it is, and your, your suits are a time machine, and it takes you down yeah. here, your robot is the same thing. Are there uh, wrecks that have not yet been discovered that you know are out there somewhere? Many, many. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've got quite a, a long list of targets that we'd like to go find and document, so that's that's part of our mission is to research, locate, and document deep water shipwrecks. We've got several we want to find west of here, and uh, there's many more than that, but these are ones that we think and know we can probably find someday. If we spend time mowing the lawn, I'll use that term again, mm -hmm. mowing sonar. What becomes a number one or a number two or a top three target? Um, that I hope to find? Yeah, yeah, for instance, if there are a number of them out there, yes. why do you choose a certain one to go after? Well, in the beginning, we, we only looked for wrecks that you could put your diving gear on and go down and explore, which was maybe 250 feet. 70 feet. The deepest one we're diving out here is 270, even though there's one in 435 feet that if you're crazy you'll do it. 
you have to have special gas mixtures, which we use on these 250 foot dives mm -hmm. as well. But what are you going to do if you dive in 400 feet of water besides go down, look at it, come back, mm -hmm. and spend hours coming back up? So, a robot, with the robot now, we don't care how deep ships are. The deepest spot on Lake Superior is 1,300 feet. Well, we have 1,500 for each other. We can actually get down and identify a wreck and maybe move the boat a bit so we can fly around and, and uh, document it. So we have some high high interest targets we want to locate west of Whitefish Point. Classic example is the two French minesweepers who were built in Canada for the Republic of France, sunk in American waters with brand new bow and stern guns that claimed over 70 Frenchmen on, two, uh, on board the two ships that were claimed by storm. They were, they were built in Fort William and rushed into service to go over and hunt for mines that were part of the Normandy coast mm -hmm. and the English Channel because the war was just fizzling out at that time. And they, they left Thunder Bay or Fort William in November, which is a classic mistake. Of the three ships that left together, two sunk, one made it. And we hope to find these uh, these wrecks with, with everything there, brand spanking new. You know, it's quite a story behind it. And so those are the kind of targets we're interested in. Incredible. So how do you come upon these stories then? So you know that the targets are out there. There's many books out uh, that list ships that have gone down, particularly those that disappeared in storm, claimed lives, uh, nobody knows where they are yet, that mm -hmm. type of thing. So we have interest from the History Channel, Discovery Channel, National Geographic. If we find French minesweepers that are very interested in possibly getting involved. So that's something we're going to start doing uh, very, very soon. Those are, those are certainly unique ships. Yes, uh, I would imagine most of these were carrying timber or some sort of mining. Right, iron ore, iron ore uh, you know, yeah. coal, uh, like you said, lumber. Or goods to supply the camps up on Lake Superior, you know, and the small communities that were starting to pop up because of mining and so on and so forth. So we've got a lot of personal goods that are down there, and uh, these microcosms of human history are frozen in time right there. Where, say, a, a terrestrial archaeologist does a big dig someplace, and they get excited when they find a fragment of bone or a button. Well, we find everything clothing, and utensils, and tools, and trade, and everything else. So it's uh, you can't tell I'm excited about doing this. Stuff. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. No. Does, does the freshwater um, treat a wreck differently than saltwater? Yeah, absolutely. The freshwater literally preserves them to some extent where saltwater, the corrosive salts, and the Torito worms and everything else will eat a lot of the wood and, and uh, you know, the uh, uh, biological substances, you know, whether it be uh, you know, clothing or founded uh, we formed the, we formed the shipwreck society in 1978 and I was a school teacher and I had some school teacher friends who were divers and we formed it got our own dive boat we started looking for wrecks and you know very successful at locating them in 1985 we opened our first little exhibit in the theater building you could seat 12 people <laughs> and we had like four or five exhibits on shipwrecks and when in one well, one and a half months we had 12,000 visitors so we said we better build a new museum. So the museum gallery you'll experience today was built in 87, and we constantly improved it with Bob. The lighthouse, which is Abraham Lincoln's lighthouse, 1861 it was built at his direction on the eve of the Civil War. The surf boat station was built here by the Coast Guard in 1923 and abandoned in 1950. So we've restored the surf boat house and so on and so forth here. We can uh, run you through some of the buildings here and uh, you have questions as we go along? Or? Well, that includes our interview with uh, Tom Farnquist. As you can see, the view around here is just absolutely spectacular. Off the point here, you can see a ship going through right now. Just a little pan of the grounds.